today's demo is going to be a railroad spike in your tomahawk. Uh, I've got a couple stages of it done. I'll be starting out standard spike. My lighting's a little bad, sorry about that. And the spike is just a quick clip notes here. Upset the whole front end, bring it back. Um, this one's about maybe five inches long, takes it back about an inch or two. After the upset, try to keep one side flat, top line here. Because then after I get my upset, I punch and drift that center hole. And after the drift, I'll spread while it's on my drift, the eye up and down. It gives that more surface area to hang on to that, uh, that wooden shaft. After that, then I'll pull out the face. The face can look as ugly as you want, doesn't really matter, because you'll come back later and cut a nice clean front end on it. And then you can file and, and treat and everything else. That's the basic, and I'm gonna get started. warmed up, but I got a little bit of slack going. I'll start trying to pull that out as I work. Uh, first, I'm just going to heat the tip up, maybe half inch to inch and a half, just this that far. I don't want a whole lot of heat because I don't want to bend the shaft before I get that point taken back down. I want that point flat. A nice high heat, get a good grip, start whaling. Now, I learned a technique of upsetting. Like everybody else, you just put it up on it and hit it. But when I was in horseshoeing school, I watched a couple guys that have to do this every day. The trick they taught me is to lift the piece just a little bit off the anvil. It actually gives a bit of a double impact. And it really, really speeds up the upsetting process. That tip's almost gone. I've got no fish lips, no curling over of the stock. This one little lip here will go away as soon as I start working it back out. But no, no use wasting uh, any hammer blows on cold steel. I take it down to uh, an orange and then I put it back in. No use fighting it. As soon as I get any kind of curvature, stop upsetting and work it back through. Because as soon as you start working on the curve, you're losing your upsetting. And you're just bending at that point. Now what I'm trying to do while I'm upsetting, I want that blade to fan this direction, the same direction as the head's facing. So when I'm upsetting and it's starting to spread in all directions, I'm forcing that spread laterally where I'd want the blade to be later. I gotta, I gotta keep it in check as I work. Get a good heat this time, we'll probably put a half to three quarters inch worth of upset to it. We'll really, really draw it back on this next heat. I'm nice and flat, direction I wanna go. If I get a good heat now, we should be pretty good. But I still don't want that heat to go too far up the shaft of that railroad spike or it'll bend on me that first good strong hit. Alright, got a good heat, got to get a good grip. As soon as it curves, correct. Don't want to lose it. It's important to correct that bend on both sides. There's another thing I was taught. Metal comes to the hammer. What that means is, if I only hammer on one side, by the time I'm done working a piece, it's going to have a trapezoidal shape. I did not know that early on in my blacksmithing day. Now 
I'm just doing some somewhat light blows now to correct the direction. I've got to kind of keep that straight shaft while correcting it the direction I want it to go. Upsetting is a long process. It is what it is. It's used a lot in, uh, in custom shoeing. Anytime you need to make a, a fuller shoe or any type of bar shoe, you're generally going to need to upset or your stock's going to get too wide in, in other sections. It won't be even all the way around. The technique I had to learn, never quite had to upset this much metal, but uh, it was good practice for when I wanted to do fun things like this. You're going to have to do a lot of corrections upsetting these just because of the way the head shaped on the railroad spike. Because it's not flat, every time I hit, that rounded head's going to try to push that metal in a different direction instead of straight down. Turn to the side here, you can see what I'm, what I'm working with. Spreading out as we go. I want to correct this divot. I don't want to leave that in there. And I want to do it so I keep this back side, and we'll call it the spine, flat. Because when I come back later to punch that out, I need a flat side to start on. Alright, I cleaned that up pretty good. Might go one more heat. That's my example here. It's about a quarter inch off the distance of my example. I'll go one more heat, and then I'll move over to punching. Not a super high heat here, but I don't want that. I don't want this thing to start going all kinds of directions on me. Like that. All I want to do is shorten it up just a little bit more. And we'll go from there. All right, looks good. Got a rudimentary axe shape. I'm happy with that to start. I'll be doing a lot of beating on it, so it doesn't have to be quite perfect. It's going to go a lot of directions before I'm done. So now what I want to do is get a heat right about where my tongs are, where I want that eye to be placed. So right in here. I want it really, really hot because I want to be able to drive that punch in as few heats as possible, preferably two. Less if I had a real strong tool. What I've got is just made with an old piece of spring steel. When I leave it in there too long, it'll lose its temper and kind of mushroom out on me. So it might be a couple of heats to get this done, but the key is to take your time. It's not about how many heats, it's about how accurate you are with that punch. Now what I did for the demonstration went just a littlest bit off of center when I first punched it. And the outcome was on the opposite side where the punch came out, I was a good quarter of the, the width of the stock off the direction where I wanted to be. I could correct that, but I shouldn't have to. I should punch it clean and straight, pay attention to every single hit. The other thing I want to do when I'm working on it is try to be careful to leave that head intact. It's kind of beat up, it takes away a bit from the end product. 
and it's always fun to leave that, that railroad spike head because people can identify with it. They can see what it was, what it came from, and they kind of get a small idea of how much work went into that piece, what you had to do to get it there. And uh, it can really, really help explain what you're doing because you just say, oh, I made this. Well, nobody knows what that means unless they're, they're a blacksmith or they watch you work. Got a great heat, punch. I hold it with my tongs because it's really hot. Do one quick punch just to line up where I want it to be. Check it. That was a little bit crooked. Correct that now before I go deep. Much better. I'm going to brush it off, clean it up, and then I'll come back out for my actual punch. Right now I just want to get it lined up and make sure I like what I see. And I like it. It's good and centered in. I know it's extremely hard to see because of the camera and everything else, but that's my slit where I'll slit punch and then I'll drift that out. Alright, see if I can get this done. Wetting my hand is another thing that kind of helps. You can kind of keep it above it a little longer. Still centered up. I don't want to deform the head of my tool. I'm going to take it back out and quench it. It gets stuck, I give a little tap on the side and normally release right away. Just kind of pushes everything back off of it. All right, now I am about a quarter inch in. I've got almost another quarter inch that I want to hit this and get it as close to the anvil without actually smacking the anvil through the piece as I can. I want a nice clean punch. I've constructed my punch is uh, the profile is the I call it the Brian Brazil style. Uh, that's where I learned it from. Uh, he kind of did it on his own, so I gave him the credit for it. I know other people have done it as well. But that's where I picked it up, so that's where I passed credit to. Um, works really well. There's a slight peak, a uh, very very high angle, so it's not just flat. And then there's facets. There's four facets, kind of help me guide straight as well as nice clean edges for it to shear off when I try to punch through the other side. This should be my final round of punching. I might be able to turn it around and knock that plug out. That is real close. Feeling good about that. Another quench. The tool gets hot. It's no good. I'm going to flatten out this base and brush off the slag. I want a nice clean surface so I can turn it over, tap it one more time, and that'll give me a little cold mark. I know that wasn't quite one more time, but what I want is to see it cold where this punch went through, and that gives me my target for this side. Now I'll lean the punch back, do one edge, pull it forward, do the next edge. My hand is really hot, I forgot to dunk it. I'm feeling confident about this, I'm going to go ahead and try to shear it off now. I'll line it back up, shearing blows. I hit off center, threw my piece across the floor. I'm getting in a rush. That happens. Slow back down. Take a breath. Still got a little bit of heat in there. It's bouncing pretty hard, which means I'm probably not lined up exactly where I need to be. I'm going to put it back in, get a little more heat, and then try to come back through. It might also just be too cold. still in good shape. I haven't bottomed it out yet. That's good. 
I'm getting a slight mushroom around the, the striking area. So as soon as we get done with this, I gotta take that mushroom off. Those mushrooms are dangerous. Those little protrusions, they'll fly off at the speed of a bullet. I've seen them go into people from across the shop. Not fun. Speaking of, I know I'm not wearing my safety glasses. I'm bad about it. It happens. I do recommend them. But on these hot days, especially rainy, sweaty, humid days, I'll end up sweating all over the glasses and can't see what I'm doing. Getting a good shear. You can actually see that. Almost a perfect shear there. Pop the plug out, the plug's still attached just to the tip by a very little bit. I think that's kind of neat to see. If you guys can see this or not, the plug's actually sheared all the way through. There's a tiny, tiny little bit of connection, but that sheared plug actually has the, the same profile as my tool, which I've now heated up. I gotta go and just start to take on color. When my tool went through, it smacked the edge of my uh, my pritchel hole. So now this tool's ruined until I grind it back together. So uh, it's always something to pay attention of. And I don't have a bolster plate or a, uh, a swage block with the right size holes. I need to pick one up or make one. Otherwise, I'll, I'll keep doing things like that and damaging my tools, which is no good. But uh, I get the profile on this. Profile still mostly the same thickness of stock, but the hole is more or less centered. Very, very handy to have. Now when I, I swage it out, it'll be nice and even. I won't get a whole lot of play in one direction or the other. Hole centered up. Profile's mostly intact, and that'll spread back out once I start working it. Clean holes centered up in stock. That's what's important. <laughs> when I heat back up, I'm going to talk about the next tool I'm going to use, which is again one that I've, I've copied from uh, Brian's style. Uh, it's not his, as far as I know, it's just a, just a drip. But the way he uses it, the way I've learned from him, uh, just from his videos, I've never met the man, but he does amazing, amazing work. Um, it's, just a, it's just a drift. This one's made of S7. I had one nice big pretty piece left, and that's what I made this out of. It's an amazing metal. Um, I just noticed a crack I've got in it. But uh, it works really well for heat and impact. And what I'll do is I'll drift that onto here and spread that metal. And once I got it kind of to an area that I like, as far as the, the width of the hole, I'll leave it on with the heat and I'll pull that eye up and down this drip to spread that eyeball out. So it's contacting in a lot more surface area than it would otherwise because it's just a straight piece across with a hole punched in it. I gotta cut the grinder on real quick and fix this tool. I will not use a tool to chip in it. Dangerous stuff. I want to get a nice good heat for this initial push because this drift is really cold right now and that heat is going to suck right out of the piece so I need it good and hot and this first drift I'm going to push through as much as I can until it gets cold because I don't want to form any fractures. Starting to cool off and go ahead and stop. That was the first set of drifting. Now, as the more I work this, the more this is going to want to bend this direction in kind of a, a U shape where I'm forcing it down into the hardy. Um, I will at some point prob probably take it over to my uh, my vise and correct this, get the uh, the head back into the correct alignment. 
But right now I'm just worried about spreading that material out. That's my, my goal. Everything else can wait till later and pretty it up, cleaning it up. I'll get another HD shot of this, the first drift. Drift in a nice clean hole, mostly centered up. Now's where you can tell if you've got any deviation. This one's pretty good. Not a whole lot of misalignment in that punch. Very happy with that. Normally I wouldn't be stopping and taking all these photos so I'd get it back into the heat and this process would go a little quicker, but it's show and tell, so it takes what it takes. Got all my tools ready, everything's where I need it. Bring it across, drop it in. I don't want to set down the anvil if I don't have to. Because everything's a heat sink when it's this hot. Everything it's going to touch is going to drain heat. That's about how far up I want it. That's a pretty good diameter for the uh, the shaft. I'll take it off. Nice clean hole, no interruptions. Mostly centered still. And I got her nice and hot. Slip it back on, tap it into place, and then I'll get the cross beam and I'll start working this direction, pulling that eye out. Now I've only got a quarter inch on this side and a little more than a quarter inch on the back to pull that material, but that material will go a long way. And the other thing is when I'm drifting, I don't want to drift it to its final size before I pull those eyes up and down the stock. Because if I take it really, really big and then stretch it even more, by the time I run that uh, drift through the final time, it's going to be huge because I'm, I'm adding to the, the, the width the diameter of that hole every time I start stretching things out and every time I reset that, that drift. Tap it back into place. Start spreading. Try to keep that head off of the anvil. I'll try to start in the center and pull that stock in both directions. I'm already cold on the back where it's been touching the anvil. So that's all I'm going to get out of that heat. It's going to deform our hole just a slightly as we work it, but when I put it back on, it'll stretch and back and forth and back and forth. As a decent start, uh, when I do these normally without uh, an audience, I'll throw them on a power hammer, and that'll give me a lot more work out of each heat. The problem is, the way my hammer's set up, it's kind of hard to do, so it's a little dangerous to, to the piece. Because if I slip just once or it starts to fall off the, uh, off the drift, I could mash the drift in half. I could you know, cut the hammer head off the end of the hatchet. There's all kinds of bad things that could happen. So doing it by hand is the safest, uh, not the quickest, though. I left it in there and talked to you guys. Wasn't paying attention. Actually burned up a little bit. <sighs> Nothing I haven't ever done before, but it wasn't burned a lot. It's still thick, so... I can work with that still. Quick on that side and come back to the other side. I didn't get last time. I want to try to keep those, those hits even on each side. I don't want to grow one too much before the other. Now these can be a lot prettier if I have, uh, if I make some, some top and bottom tools for this, or just some bottom tools, I can make like a, a swage, like a V shape or a, a, a curved V. So when I start upsetting it again, it'll curve these rounded eye bulges into a nice clean shape. Or I can follow them later. And that's probably what I'm gonna do because I don't have a swage block built for that. take it over here to the, the uh, vise real quick. I want to true up, fix that shape a little bit. It's getting a little out of control.
just enough to get back in alignment and then I can come back and work it again. See, if I was doing this with a, uh, they call it a camelback or a, a bottom tool, a bottom swage, it would look like this and I was hitting it on top. That would work both sides at the same time. But I don't like them. I'm not comfortable with them because I haven't used them a whole lot yet. And my problem is I'll start doing that and I'll, I'll get misaligned and it won't come out quite as pretty as if I just done it by hand. Just about done. I think I got one more heat on the side that needs it. And then that side will be done. And I'll move on to uh, spreading the blade. I'm working this pretty cold right now, but it's more of just kind of planishing blows, trying to true everything up. I'm not really trying to move a whole lot of metal at this time. Gotten a slight kink. I still got some heat where I want it. Put it in the vise, correct it, so everything's nice and straight again. Hammerhead is a little crooked. I'll straighten it later. We get one more heat. I'll drift all the way set to my final drift position, and then go to work on the uh, the blade. I've upset a lot of metal there, so I'm going to be able to draw that blade out quite a bit. Now when I'm doing my final drift, I want to make sure not to hurt those areas I upset, so I'm sitting it a little crooked inside the hardy, because I've got a very large hardy hole I can do that. Go one way. I'll flip it over and come back the other because I want a bit of an hourglass shape to hold that the uh, hold that wooden stock in place. So we need a little tap. Now my eye is done. It's spread out nice and wide. We're down to. Just under one eighth at the edge, we're at about an eighth in the center of the eye. That's more than enough for a little hatchet tomahawk. So we're at a sixteenth, swelling to an eighth, then back down to a sixteenth. But uh, here, where it connects in with the rest of the stock, it's come back out to just a little over a quarter inch. So that's a nice, strong area. I got a little, couple little areas that it got burnt up. It's a tomahawk; it'll be fine. A blade, the stresses aren't going to be on a long, thin area. This would be great. Sorry, this isn't very bright. Get a little more light here. There we go. I tend to switch to a different set of tongs for this. And I hold it actually in the eye. Sometimes I'll scratch the eye up a little bit. And I go with some closed grip tongs, come all the way to the to the together. These are about an eighth inch, maybe three sixteenths. Take this. Hard blow, start from the center, work my way out with the cross pin. I'll come back in slightly on the blade, try to get an even draw. Swap side, do the same thing. I don't want to keep working on one side. Or else I have that trapezoidal shape I do not want. It.
Now I'm, I do it myself sometimes. You start working and you kind of get a little detailed work in your head and you forget how to swing the hammer. You'll, you'll hit, you'll hit. You'll do a little bit, but you're not really working that piece like you should. So when it's time to do some really heavy drawing, just remember, it's a hammer, your blacksmith. Pick it up, get it head high, and just start wailing. As long as you got hammer control and you can keep it going where you want to, the higher you go, the harder you hit. Just make sure you have a good soaking heat so the core of that, that railroad spike where your blade's going to be is actually hot. Because if you just heat it up real quick, ramp that heat up, you're just going to get a heat on the outside. The core is going to be a lot colder, so you, you can form fractures or pockets inside that steel. And that's no good. You don't want that. working up and down as well as forward and back on the blade because I want a nice taper from the back of this stock where it's full size down to the edge. Just cleaning it up a bit. I'm getting kind of close to the shape and the size I want. So I don't want to leave too many big divots in it from the cross painting, so I'll come back every now and then and work them out just slightly. Now if I were to go a little slower and work just a little more precise, I'd have to stop and do some corrective blows. I can keep the head nice and flat straight across the top and then down into the beard. This one I'm just spreading to spread and it'll go where it needs to. It'll go up, it'll go down, and I'm gonna kinda of bring it out into a fan. Not gonna have any flats on this one. Cause I don't have the tool stills I need to make the chisels I want. But uh, I am thinking about it. Change the directions of where this cross pin is hitting to guide the direction of the steel where I want it. I'm going to pull this one down into not quite a beard, but longer on the bottom than it is on the top. And again, I'm just going to clean it up, take some of those hammer blows out. It does not matter what the edge looks like, where the blade's going to be. That does not matter. Pull it out, get it thin, get it the basic shape of what you want it. Because when I come back, after I'm done pulling it out all I want, I'll cut the edge of that off into the nice clean blade shape that I want. I see a lot of these guys that'll make tomahawks and they don't know quite how much metal's in there. Um, the very first piece I ever made, I'll take some photos of it, it's a, it's a railroad spike I turned into a sickle. I took that railroad spike my first time at the forge and I smashed it down to a quarter inch by quarter inch rod. It was over 18 inches long, it's huge. Turned it around, arched it, put a blade on it, turned the, the uh, the head of the railroad spike side into a big beak and made it uh, made it look like a herring herring's head and it's just it it showed me how much metal you can displace and move around on a railroad spike there's a whole lot there to work with you just got to know where to put it if I weren't upsetting these before I started they wouldn't be nearly so big I have to push that metal back in so I can push it out the other direction sit around with some play-doh and you know start with how much you think you'll need and See how much you actually need after you're done making it with Play-Doh first. It's all the same thing. Just some clean up blows now, fixing everything up. A little bit of flat edge work.
the less I have to try to file out and grind out later is, uh, is better. I'm happy with that. That's a good size. It's kind of where I want it. Bring it over to the HD. I'll measure that for you guys real quick. And remember, it doesn't matter what this looks like right now because I'm going to put a nice line on it and bring the hot cut around and cut that off nice and clean. So we started with standard railroad spike. Standard railroad spike is not quite 5 8. It's, it's just on the line of 5 8 on one side, just a little thinner on the other. It's uh, 7 16 by 5 8, more or less. They're, they're not quite square, they're close. So we've taken that, we've upset this piece into this piece which went from roughly six inches long to five inches long. So we've upset an inch worth of that to give us one and an eighth inch worth of width this direction. And that's where I want to pull that blade from. This one might have been just a little bit wider. So we go from that to then punching the eye slit first, then drifted, that's a basic drift, and this is the start of pulling the, uh, the sides of the eye up and down the stock. That gave us a little bit of length again. Took us back up to five and a quarter, and about a quarter inch worth of, uh, of growth. This one, the eye's been finalized, the blade's been pulled out, this one's more of a beard style, pretty flat up here, I can heat this up and make this flat so it's only bearded instead of coming up both directions. This one is uh, three and an eighth, and the one I've just forged out is three and a half width. So three and a half from originally five eighths. That's quite a bit of growth. We're looking at, still got about an eighth inch worth of stock at the tip. And I'll address that with the file later. Right now, I'm gonna heat it back up. I'm down to my last little nub of my, uh, my welding pencil. These things are terrific. They'll actually keep the mark in the fire. So that's what I want for the blade, real basic. I might come back on this end, either grind or cut this off. Bring it down that direction. Something to conform with this flow. I don't know. I can do that with the file later. Right now, I just want to cut this off nice and clean. I've got a piece of aluminum. It's extremely loud, but this will let me cut on top of the anvil without worrying about damaging my tool or the anvil. I'll probably use a couple different cuts. I like being able to go by hand. I think to lay my initial line, I'll use my fullering tool. Um, it's radius, as well as slightly curved. Um, it's for putting the fullers into horseshoes. And that slight radius on it will allow me to rock and pull across without getting corner marks where I don't want them. don't need a lot of heat here. I just need a little bit of heat to give me a, a mark in the cut without damaging my tools. If I get too much heat, it will burn off that uh, pencil mark. You can barely see it still.
I can come back through with a higher heat and actually shear that off, get a nice bunch of wax on it. And now we've got a nice pretty edge that we're going to have when I get done there, something I can file nice and pretty later on. You still see some of that silver pencil mark for where I'm going to cut the bottom off later. Got a nice heat. I'm going to try to work quick. Add aluminum. Pull that heat right out of there so I got to kind of work through it. Turn this out. Here we go. It just popped off. Got a nice clean profile. I'll straighten that out. Get the nice clean shape that I want. Make sure it's not, you know, curving like it is right now. That would be probably my final heat. I like to leave them a little rough so you know that I actually worked on them instead of whatever people think I've done. Um, I'm going to leave this in here, this, this bulge at the back. I'll, uh, I'll clean it up with the file later. I'm not going to take quite as much off as I thought I would. So I'm get one last heat and I'll shape. And, uh, and I'll probably go inside for a little while, hook the computer all back up, get it all ready, and then start the hand filing process. Takes a few more pictures and uh, I can find a piece of wood, I'll throw it on the lathe real quick, turn out a handle, and uh, we'll go from there. Profile it, horizon. Pretty good. Good enough for a quick hatchet anyway. Got a slight bit of a kink this direction. I'm probably going to get heat right here. Heat this section up, put the uh, drift back in, and then bend that eye back out so it has less of this little kink to it. All these little finalized touches so I don't have to put it back in the forge later on. Once I file it, I don't like to heat it back up in the forge. Uh, if this is a railroad spike, I will quench it in water. It has not nearly enough carbon in it to make me worry about fracturing. Um, I have uh, tempered them with a color draw which is where I'll leave the heat back towards the eye and let it draw back up to straw. Probably won't do that with this one. Um, just because I'd like to get it filed first and I may or may not heat it back up later. If I had a torch, it'd be a lot easier, but I don't have a torch yet. Another thing that Kickstarter might help with, give me some proper tools. Not just what I can find in an auction. Gotta be real careful that I don't screw anything up now, as far as my shape goes. I just want a little bit of a correction, and that's all. I ain't quite as pretty as I like it to be, but for a demo, I'm happy with it. Waiting on someone to invent a cheaper butcher block brush. These are $20 each. It really bugs me. It's just, it's a piece of wood with some metal stuck to it. I hate that they're $20 each. Uh, tangs get bent, get rusty, and break off. This one's already started on the back corner. It's normal the piece gets hit the most, but we wear these things out. The 
heat just the blade up and then I'm going to quench it. Take it up to a critical temperature, non-magnetic. Quench, quick quench. I do have some oil nearby, but I'm not going to bother with it. Road spikes are not the best metal. They are what they are. They're fun. They're a novelty. They can be used as a tool. It's, there's nothing wrong with it. If I'm going to go to the trouble to try to get an exact quench and temper and hardness on it, I'm going to use a, a good metal, good starting base metal. Got to keep that moving around because you're going to get a shroud of steam around it and that's going to slow your quenching process. That's if you can look up, uh, you know, just Google super quench formula, you'll find a, uh, a couple chemical additives you can add to your water, including dish soap. And what it does is it, uh, it prevents things from sticking. I can't remember what the chemical is called, but it will prevent the water from boiling off and it'll actually let it come in contact right up against that. And it'll like a, a much deeper, a much stronger hardness out of water. Even on mild steel, you can can temper them up pretty good. So that's that. That's uh, the quick demo. My eye is an inch and a quarter by three quarter. Appreciate you watching, guys.